Good morning and uh, welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. It's uh, great to uh, have you all here. Uh, since this is Zoom worship, can you make sure you're all muted and look at you. Before I made the announcement, most of you are already all muted. Of course, if you have a speaking part, you can remain uh, or you can just unmute yourself when your speaking part comes. Uh, of course, you know me, but if you don't, my name is Pastor Jamie and um, I'm your pastor, even though we many of us have not met face to face, certainly not recently, but I look forward to uh, to uh, that day. It's great to have you here. I hope you have a, um, a sense of expectation that God wants to speak to you today through prayers, through the song, through the words, and uh, through our being together. A few announcements, just a reminder, Thursday night is a Bible study night, 6.30. If you haven't joined us, please uh, consider it. And certainly if you're a regular, we're on again this uh, Thursday. If this is your church home, just a reminder that even though we're not meeting in the building, we still have uh, ministry needs. So um, please continue to um, make your uh, pledges. And I'm sure Carla and the team uh, will be excited about, about that. Uh, also, I'd like to meet with all of you in a small group on Zoom. So Maggie sent something out this week, uh, not tomorrow, but next week on February 27th is one gathering in the evening, Monday evening from 6.30 to 7.30. We'll just gather like this and I'll uh, just ask some questions of who are you, where are you from, and how long you've been at Trinity, and then answer any questions you have. I have two times, next Monday evening and next Wednesday morning. I'll have Maggie send that out again and... Uh, uh, she'll be calling everybody. So please sign up before you, uh, she uh, gives you a call. So I'd love to uh, meet with you all. Uh, today we have kind of a special Sunday. We have uh, some of our scouts with us and they're going to help lead us in uh, worship. But I thought Steve would just tell us a little bit about scouting and Trinity. So um, Steve, could you tell us a little bit about scouting and trinity and then we'll we'll uh, hear from the boys sure so thanks elijah so today is uh, scout sunday it's uh uh kind of coincides with uh scouting's uh, birthday and uh all scouts across uh, all faiths uh, this weekend are um encouraged to participate in their uh their worship services at church uh, here at Trinity, we have uh, Elijah, who is a Bear Scout, and we have uh, Luke and Colin. Uh, Luke is uh, Weeblos, and uh, Colin is a Tiger Scout. All right. And uh, I'm also serving in the pack as uh, a leader in uh, a couple different uh, um, forms, uh, one of which is encouraging Scouts to... Um, learn about uh, their family's faith. So uh, I uh, help coordinate the religious emblems uh, program in uh, PAC 49. At, uh, at Trinity, the, the PAC um, is involved actually if, um, um, if you uh, haven't uh, noticed, uh, some of the, the dens uh, have been uh, meeting at Trinity, of course, before COVID times. Um, so uh, some of our dens, I uh, use the, the church space to, to meet and uh, do their programs. And uh, the, the PAC also uses um, the opportunity to uh, serve with uh, out of the box, obviously, because scouts are encouraged to, um, to uh, serve their community. And uh, out of the box is uh, one of those that um, uh, the, uh, the, the dens participate with uh, the, um, the different uh, dens with, you know, in small uh, groups um, uh, coordinate with uh, out of the box to uh, take turns uh, on a weekly uh, basis to, um, to, to show up uh, for uh, food packing and, and food distribution. So uh, if um, you've been involved with uh, out of the box, maybe you've seen some of our uh, scouts uh, there at times as well. Super. Thanks so much for uh, sharing. And now uh, each of the scouts is just going to basically answer the question, 
what is the scout law and how does it apply to the faith? And Elijah has agreed to go first. So Elijah, what is the scout law and how does it apply to faith, do you think? Scout law. My favorite point is scout law. Um, Didn't you say helpful? Helpful. And uh, how is uh, being helpful relate to God in your life? Oh, um, helpful relates to God, but because he knows what you need before you even need it. That's great. Well, thank you so much. I love your uniform and all those badges. So when I meet you face to face, I want to one day see you wear that to church so I can ask you about all your badges. Is that good? I have no idea what some of them are for. <laughs> <laughs> They're for your well, ranks, right? Well, now you need to get the badge of truthfulness. That's wonderful. <laughs> uh, Colin is also going to share. Uh, Colin, what is the scout law and how does it apply to faith? Um, so brave. Um, a scout is brave. A scout is brave. And sometimes I have to be brave for God. That's right. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And Luke, how about yourself? Um, so a, a scout is is reverent, and you and you be you can be reverent to God, like by by bowing your head when you pray, and 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 saying His name, and and saying His name in the right way. Sure. That's wonderful. Well, boys, thank you for reminding us of scouts. I was a scout when, when I was your age, and I, I made it through Weebelos. And I, I was looking for my badge today, but I couldn't find it. But I'm going to find it and, and uh, stick it on my uh, shirt. Thanks for sharing, boys. I know you're going to share in just a little bit, but could we all pray for the, the, the scouts? Let's pray, and particularly our kids. Lord, we thank you for the scouting program, and we uh, pray for the leaders across the United States and the world that they would be leaders to exemplify the, the scouting rules and laws and ethos. And we pray for our boys, Lord, for Elijah and Colin and Luke. And we ask that this program would help them learn new things, would help them feel competent and confident in who they are and what they can do. And we thank you, Lord, that the, the scouting law intersects with our faith. And so we ask your blessing upon them. Uh, we, we pray that you'd be with our boys as they continue to follow the scout law and work toward being trustworthy and loyal and helpful and friendly and courteous and kind and obedient and cheerful and thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Lord, we thank you. We give you all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. What I'd love to tell you all that I, re I remembered the scout law, but I did not. So I had it typed out and I read it just in case you knew that. Now the boys are going to lead us in our call to worship uh, from Psalm 46. And Luke is going to read first and then Elijah and then Colin. Luke, will you start us off? Here's our call to worship. God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God, God says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Fantastic, boys. That's wonderful. I'm Sure, that was a delight to our God. Let's uh, let's sing "A Mighty Fortress Is Our God" based off uh, 
based off uh, Psalm 46. to worship which mysteriously has left me you can hang on just a second Gracious God, we confess that we have longed too much for the comforts of this world. We have loved the gifts more than the giver. In your mercy, help us to see that all the things we strive after are mere shadows, but you are substance, that they are quicksand, but you are our mountain, that they are shifting, but you are an anchor. We ask your forgiveness. Now hear our private prayers of confession. We pray all this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. spoke a word you were singing over me 
been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You've been so, so kind Till I'm found Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. Can you all hear me? Yes. So you weren't able to see the video, right? No. No, just the audio. <laughs> Great. Um, Hang on just a second. I'm bound to leave the night. Uh, let, me, let me try it one more time. I'm so sorry. This is really frustrating. Uh, My teacher has this problem. Yeah, well, thank you for your help, my friend. Let's try it this time. Share screen. Bum, bum, bum. All right, can you all see a black screen now? Yes. Okay. Now, can you see my guitar player? Yes? Yes. Okay. Take two. Thank you, Elijah. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You've been so, so good. I took a breath, you breathe your life in me. You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down, fights till I'm found. The 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. Till I'm found, leave the 99. 
I couldn't learn it. I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, Lie you won't tear down Coming after me Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God It chases me down Fights till I'm bound To leave the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Till you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of Thank you for your uh, patience. So can you hear me all okay? And you can see me all okay, right? Good deal. One of the most asked questions in life, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, is this. Why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow bad things to happen, not just to quote unquote bad people, but to good people as well? This morning, we're going to think about this question. Now, there's not an answer that will fully satisfy it, but I hope that uh, this message will help you be uh, comforted, encouraged, and find hope in this broken world. We are uh, in a sermon series called Pursued. We are pursued to be pursuers. And there should be some PowerPoint coming up. Do you see PowerPoint yet? No? Okay. Well, Terry's working on that. Um, I don't have permission. All right. Let me give you permission. There you go. Permission granted. Yeah. And uh, we'll right over to here. All right. Now I'm just trying to find everybody. All right. There we go. All right. So we're in a sermon. You can hear me all. Okay. Right. Okay, good. Thanks. We're in a sermon series called Pursued, and the theme is basically we are pursued by God who, uh, will, who, who pursues us 
And then he calls us to pursue uh, other people. And we're thinking about this um, theme through the life uh, and the uh, ministry of the Apostle Paul. In our text this morning that, that I'm going to read, the Apostle Paul is on his, uh, he's done three missionary journeys in modern day Turkey uh, and into Greece. And now he's on his way to Rome. He's, uh, he's always wanted to go to Rome. In fact, God had told him through the spirit that he was going to go to Rome. And he's finally on his way to Rome and he's going to Rome uh, in a boat. Uh, the irony is, and the great surprise is, is that Paul is going not as a free preacher, but as an enslaved prisoner. He is going to Rome because he has appealed to Rome uh, to judge his case. Uh, and uh, he's going to Rome as a, a prisoner. So that's the big surprise. And uh, our text is Acts 27, verse uh, 13 to 26. And uh, he is on the, off the island of Crete. And he's warned them that they shouldn't sail because uh, winter is coming and it's not a good time to, to, uh, to uh, sail in the winter. So here's the, uh, here's the text. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So they weighed anchor and they sailed along the shore of Crete. Before long, a wind of hurricane forced called a Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and we were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kata, we were hardly able to, to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it abroad. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Cerritos, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. And when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously, graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. May uh, God bless the reading and the teaching and the hearing and the living out of this, his living word. It was March 10th, 1984. Ed Warren, Pastor Ed Warren, got up on a hut, North Carolina summer morning. He kissed his wife and two boys goodbye, got in a car, and headed to a pastor's conference. They were driving from North Carolina to Florida. And when they got to Florida, they were rather tired. So he and three of his pastor buddies got out of the car, got to uh, a cup of coffee, got back in the car and headed back to their conference in Southern Florida. As they were driving down the road, a truck was coming towards them. The truck hit a metal pipe in the road. The pipe flew up, hit Ed Warren in the head through the windshield, killing him instantly. Ed's wife was now a widow. Ed's two boys were now fatherless. Ed's younger brother, my friend of over 30 years, Larry, would now have a crisis of faith. His questions were questions that you and I ask. 
when we were in a similar situation or when we, why didn't God prevent this from happening? Why was the timing such one second either way would have meant Ed would have lived? Can we really trust God with our lives in life and in death? Why God? Why? And again, while our quest for these kinds of answers to these questions will fall short, I think our text today will help us. The Apostle Paul is in the middle of a storm. And as with many storms, as times passed, the storm got worse and worse. The text opens up in verse 4 and says, the winds were against us. I mean, they're just kind of unsettling winds, but nothing to be too alarmed about. But certainly those winds being against us turned into a wind of hurricane force that crashed against their boat. See, what started off as a difficult day ended up being a life-threatening situation. So the crew did everything they could to survive. They pulled in the lifeboat. They passed ropes underneath the, the boat to, to keep it together. Um, they lowered their anchor to act as a brake. And after they pulled in the lifeboat, wrapped the vessel with rope, threw out the anchor, they started to throw the cargo overboard to lessen the weight. And finally, verse 19 says, on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. They were doing anything and everything they could to survive the storm. All this effort did nothing to calm their hearts. Verse 20 describes their feelings and the scene really well. It says this, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. I mean, what a description. They gave up all hope. When the sun nor stars appeared for many days, they gave up all hope. Now, the author of this, Dr. Luke, is writing actual history, and he goes to great lengths to talk about uh, navigating a ship through storms and the geography. But Luke is also writing theology here. He not only wants us to know the history, but he also wants us to know how does this apply to our lives, that we as followers of Jesus will experience storms. And what are the anchors that can tether us in our faith when we experience storms? What will anchor you in your storms? Storms in the past, what, what kept your faith from sinking? Storms yet to come, what will keep you anchored when the winds and the waves are not just a, a soft gale wind, but are bashing against our souls? And when, when we get in storms, we tend to work harder. We tend to, you know, haul in the lifeboat, duct tape our emotions, um, throw things out of our lives. But, but that may help when the winds are just calm. But, but when we're in a hurricane-like storm, these kind of efforts are insignificant. When cancer comes or our efforts feel but a Band-Aid, when life is taken in an instant, when a marriage dissolves or when children are out of control or when addiction just won't go away, our efforts just fall short. So we need some anchors. And there are many in the scriptures. But out of this context, I want us to think about three, three anchors. Now, anchors don't prevent storms. Are you with me on that? Anchors don't prevent storms. Anchors can help us survive storms, prevail in storms when they come. Um, anchors will, can prevent us from sinking they will not prevent the storm. And so anchor number one has to just do with our attitude, and that is expect storms. Anchor number one is expect storms in life. Paul expected a storm to come because it was winter. Winter is the season for storms, and that's why he warned them. They expected storms to come because it was the season for storms. And when the uh, Apostle Paul was first called to be a pursuer of other people, God had told them that you're going to suffer. I'm calling you, but you're going to suffer. In other words, Paul ex expected storms. 
Jesus said this. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. That's really clear. He said, you will. He said, expect storms. He said, no servant is greater than his master. They will, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. What Jesus is saying is that every day on planet Earth is the season for storms. Every day on planet Earth is the season for storms. It doesn't mean we're going to have a storm every day. But it's going to be that storms are the natural ebb and flow of life, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. And for Paul, when he experienced storms, he wasn't surprised. It didn't shake his faith because, because that's what God had told him ahead of time. Similarly, Jesus told us, in this life you will have trouble. Expect storms. When a storm comes, it doesn't mean that I'm not in control. I'm not sovereign. I am sovereign. And I'm telling you ahead of time, storms will come. When storms came to the Apostle Paul, it confirmed God's word. It didn't contradict it. I think so often for us, because we don't expect storms, when storms come, it seems to contradict what we think God's word is. But it doesn't. It should confirm it for us as well. Number one is expect storms. One anchor is expect storms. Number two is know God. Know the nature of God. The Apostle Paul knew who God was. He had a strong theology of what God was like, and so it acted as an anchor in the storm. In verse 23, he writes this, or Luke writes this. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of, of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me. God, Paul knew the nature of God. Paul knew that, that he belonged to God. Paul knew that God was not always safe, but that God was always secure. He knew the nature of God, that God wasn't safe, but he was secure because God is sovereign. What Paul found out was what Abraham and Moses and Jeremiah and Martha and Peter and John and Jesus all discovered. That God doesn't always prevent storms. Sometimes he does, but we don't give him credit. Why? Because the storm didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, God answers prayer. God does prevent some storms from coming. God does heal cancer sometimes. God does prevent our kids from harm, but so often he doesn't get the credit because it didn't happen. And we just think, oh, maybe that would have happened anyway. Paul knew the God of the third day. Our text says, on the third day, they gave it their best effort, but when the sun didn't shine, when the stars did not twinkle, when the storm continued to rage, they gave up all hope on the third day. I think Luke is, is telling us something by this phrase, on the third day. Have you ever heard that phrase before, on the third day? On the third day, or at least on the beginning of the third day, things can seem so hopeless. Things can seem so dark. Unless you know the God of the third day. Unless you know the God of the third day. Remember this story? On the third day, little Isaac asked his daddy, Daddy, where's the sacrifice? I see the fire. I see the wood, but daddy, on the third day, little Isaac asked, where was the offering? And on that third day, Abraham, in the beginning of the third day, Abraham must have felt so hopeless. On that third day, it must have been very dark for Abraham. But it was on that third day that Abraham learned to trust God and his word, for Abraham delivered God and provided a lamb at the end of the third day. It was on the beginning of the third day when a messenger came into the camp of David and told them that the king of the land, Saul, and David's best friend, Jonathan, was dead. The king of the land, the anointed one of God, and his best friend were dead. So life on the third day, at the beginning of the third day for David, must have felt so starless, 
so hopeless, so dark. It sure didn't look like that. Things would turn hopeful. But because of that, the God of the third day ushered in the kingdom of Israel because of David. It was on the third day that Jonah could not see stars or sun inside the whale. For Jonah on the beginning of the third day, it must have looked so hopeless and so helpless. But it was on that third day towards evening that the light began to shine in the darkness. It was on the third day that Jonah moved from disobedience to obedience. Hopelessness turned to great hope on the third day for Jonah. And it was on the third day, on the morning of the third day, the two women got up very early in the morning while it was still dark. And when they reached the tomb to anoint their dead leader, the stone was rolled away. And on the third day, things got worse. It was on that third day in the morning, on that morning of darkness and despair, when their hearts were heavy and life was limp, that these women went to the tomb. On the third day, the storm raged for them. But it was on the later in the morning, on the third day, when they appeared, an angel appeared to them. And he told them good news. He has risen just as he said. It was on the third day that they encountered the living Jesus. It was on the third day that the sun came out. It was on the third day that death was defeated. It was on the third day that, that God turned the hopelessness of the grave into the hope of eternal life. It was on the third day that God turned the symbol of pain, torture, and the end into a symbol of comfort, hope, and the beginning. On the third day, on the third day, Luke tells us. Paul knew the God of the third day. Paul knew that darkness wasn't the final word. Paul knew that death wasn't the final word because he knew God. He knew that God isn't always safe, but that God is always secure. Anchor number one, expect storms. Anchor number two, know God. God is the God of the third day. Anchor number three is know yourself. In other words, know what you are in God's eyes. Know who you are. The Apostle Paul not only knew God, but he knew who he was in God's eyes as well. In verse 23, Paul says, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve. See, Paul knew he was a servant. Paul knew his life wasn't his own. Paul knew that his life was bought at a price. Why? Please hear this. That he knew he was dearly loved. He knew that he was of inestimable worth and value and loved beyond all description, despite circumstances, in spite of circumstances. When the storm raged, Jesus had told him, in this world you will have trouble, but have courage, take heart, I've overcome the storms of life. You see, no matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how long you've been a follower of Jesus, no matter how mature you are in the faith, when storms come, and they will come, it, it rocks our faith. The very best of us, even though we're tethered with different anchors, we still tend to drift. We still tend to wander because of storms. Storms can test our faith like nothing else. Think of Jesus. In the Gospel of, uh, I, I believe, Matthew, Right before he's tested, it shows he's being baptized. Remember this? And a voice from heaven, it's God saying, This is my son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. God says that about each and every one of you. This is my daughter, whom I love. With them I am well pleased. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is my son and daughter. With you I'm well pleased. Why? Because you're dearly loved. The very next scene after Jesus is told by God that you're my son and I love you dearly. The very next scene, Jesus suffers. And the evil one tries to tempt him in the suffering. Remember, Jesus goes into the desert. He's tested for 40 days and 40 nights. And the evil one comes to him and says, if you are the son of God. Tell these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God. The word if implies this. If you're really the son of God and loved by God so much, 
why are you suffering so? If God really loves you, you wouldn't be suffering. But because you're suffering, maybe God doesn't love you as much as you think he does. Take matters into your own hands. Don't trust God. Turn these stones into bread. You have the power to do it. You see, even for Jesus, when he was tempted, when a storm came into his life, that was a, a time where the evil one came in and tried to test his faith. Paul knew that he was loved, dearly loved. And when the storm came, that didn't shake him as much. Number one, expect storms. Number two, know God. Know that God is the God of the third day. And anchor number three, know yourself. Know that you are dearly loved. God so loved you. Not just loved you, but so loved you. That he's willing to send his one and only son to die so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you can experience fullness of life now and in the life to come. Three anchors. Well, it's been over 30 years since Ed Warren met his tragic death in that freak automobile accident. Larry and I have kept in touch over the years. I just talked with him a couple days ago. A couple years ago, I asked him, Larry, how are you doing with Ed's death? What was that like for you then? And what's it like for you now? And Larry said that there's been a lot of good that's come from this terrible accident. He said that God has and is redeeming the day of ruin. He said that God has and is redeeming the day of ruin. Larry told me that for him, it's made him so aware of the brevity of life. Ed's sudden death helped him to realize what's really important and people are important. Larry told me that Ed's death made him uh, so much more sensitive to the suffering of others. So much so that Larry changed his career plans. He left the business world and he and his wife and four boys went to Kenya to serve in the name of Jesus. Larry now heads up a group called Leadership International that trains thousands of African pastors. And for over 30 years now, uh, Leadership International, led by Larry Warren, has helped thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people grow and mature in their faith. Ed's accident happened on March 10th, 1984. And for years, March 10th was a sad day in the Warren household. It was a day that they got that phone call. It was a day of devastation. It was a day of sadness and storms. It was a day when the sun did not shine and the stars did not twinkle. And for 10 years on that day, March 10th, that was the way it was until 10 years later. On March 10th, 1994, Larry and Mary Warren gave birth to a little baby. They named him Joshua. Joshua mean salvation has come. And in a sense, salvation had come to Larry and Mary. Because while March 10th was still a day of sadness, God had redeemed that day. And on March 10th, brought forth a new day, a new day with little Joshua. So on March 10th, over the years, they'd have a birthday party. And the day of sadness and sorrow was replaced with some light, with singing and joy. Not fully, but mostly and mainly. And Larry looks forward to another day, the day, when all relationships will be fully redeemed. And when he sees his Lord, and when he sees his brother face to face. I have three questions for you to help you apply this sermon and this text. The first question is, is this. What storm has happened in your life that really rocked your faith? And why do you think it did? What storm has happened in your past that really rocked your faith and why do you think it did? Question number two is, of the three anchors, expect storms, know God, know yourself, which one is particularly helpful for you? Which anchor do you think you need to incorporate more in your life? And question number three is, what do you think you can do to prepare yourself and your faith 
for the next storm? What do you think you can do to prepare yourself and your faith for the next storm? Jesus said in this life, there will be storms. But we are to have courage. One of the ways we can actively have courage is to drop some anchors. Expect storms. Every day is storm season on the sea called earth. Number two, know the God of the third day. And number three, know who you are, that God loves you and likes you beyond all description. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we are prone to wander. We are prone to leave you, especially when we suffer, especially when the winds howl and the darkness comes. Help us to be tethered to you. Help us to be strong. Help us to be uh, build our lives upon you, our solid rock. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this wonderful uh, song of the church. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest spring. Oh, holy name, on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, the ever-ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On darkest very night when a storm was raging in Jesus' life.
life. On the very night that his life was about to be arrested, where he was about to experience betrayal, where he was about to experience spiritual, emotional, and relational suffering, Jesus took a common loaf of bread, the Passover bread, and he gave it new meaning. He took the bread, and after he broke it, he said, this is my body broken for you. They had never heard these words. They were confused. This is my body broken for you, he said. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember. Likewise, he took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And then he said that wonderful word again, remember, remember, we are most prone to forget in the midst of a storm. And Jesus said, a storm is about to happen. So remember, remember. And every time we share in the bread and every time we lift the cup, what you are doing individually is you're reaffirming your faith as a follower of Jesus. And what we do as a church, we're re reaffirming our faith as Trinity Presbyterian Church that on Christ the solid rock I stand, on other ground is sinking sand. So take and eat, take and drink, or you can take it and, and dip it. Let's partake the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. loving God, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for the Apostle Paul that models so much for us. And I pray, Lord, that today as we go forward, may we be men and women, boys and girls of courage. May we follow you. May we live for you. May we share good news in our lives and in our words. We ask for your blessing so that we can be a blessing to others. We pray this in the good and great name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that your life also would overflow with hope by and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Well, good to be with you all today. Scouts, thank you so much for uh, helping lead us in worship. Uh, your words and your voice was very um, meaningful and inspirational and brought joy to our hearts. Yes, church? Our hearts. Uh, we're going to take a 30 second break. And, yeah, thank you, Rob. We're going to take a 30 second break. And then for those of you who can uh, just join us, we'll have a brief time of just sharing and checking in. So take a 30 minute break. We'll be right back and we'll just check in with each other. Thank you.